Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Depesh Navsaria in pediatrics. He was born in London, England, and then grew up in New York City. He uh, graduated from high school from the Bronx High School of Science, and then went to Boston University, where he majored in biology and English literature. Then he got a master's of public health at Boston University, and then he went to the University of Illinois and got a master's of science in library, in, uh, library and information science. And as a person who used to work at the Dixon Public Library in high school, it's a very good thing to have a librarian in the house. Then he got his master's degree at the, excuse me, his MD degree at the University of Illinois. He came here in 2006 for his fellowship and since 2009 has been on the faculty here. Today, he's going to talk with us about early experiences elevate everything, early brain and child development. Please join me in welcoming Depeche Navsaria to Wednesday night at the lab. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is talking about the uh, work out there. I, I will tell you up front that I'm actually a crummy researcher, so why I'm in something with the title lab in it is, uh, is kind of interesting. <coughs> but I like to take other people's research and really say, how can we package this? How can we understand it? And how can we apply it to the world around us so we can use that to drive good programs, good policies, and good advice that we, we give to folks? I will also answer the question that most people have when they hear my bio, short bio and see all the letters after my name. Yes, I have a lot of student loan debt. So <laughs> yeah, get, get that out of the way there. So, so in the medical world, we always have disclosure slides. I've learned all functional disclosures and off-label discussion in my presentation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, although, as you will see, I'm not sure if the FDA has ever formally approved mousing as a use of board books. Um, <laughs> This is actually my son who's now 15 and is highly embarrassed that I show this, so I try to show it as often as I, as I can. So on our short voyage together tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the world of the early brain and the development of children. We're going to talk a bit about the science about it, about what we know out there, the result of what happens when things don't go so well, talk about some principles of solutions and, and one example of a, of a solution that gets at that, and then finally kind of wrap that all together. However, my master's in library science, so you know, many people say, oh, you know, you're in healthcare, you must have gotten a degree in informatics or you know, medical literature, et cetera. It was actually in children's literature. But now let's talk a bit about the science of the early brain. The American Academy of Pediatrics, which is one of my primary professional homes, has this agenda for children that they lay out. And this one's from a few years ago. But uh, still in the middle are some of the central priorities for the academy. And you can see early brain and child development is still there in that kind of key portion of what the academy is looking at. And really, it's something that we've done and worked on. And I'm proud to have served in the national leadership group for the academy on this. Now, over 10 years ago, the National Scientific Council on the Developing Child said, let's take all the research that's out there about children, and let's see if we can pull these things together into key points, into key points that we can use to guide policies, programs, and the advice that we give. Because there's a lot of work out there, and it's sometimes hard to know, well, should I follow this, shouldn't I? Is this going to be disproven? What's really the big picture that's out there? And even though this report is over 10 years old, all the principles in it hold true today and, in fact, have been strengthened by the research since then. So I want to walk us quickly through those, through those items. One, they came out and said child development is a foundation for community and economic development. We're not used to talking about children this way, right? We say, oh, we should help children because they're good. We should, children are worth helping, right? We don't talk about them as part of infrastructure development. But the thing is, the infrastructure of the early brain is as much a part of our future economy and our society as highways and bridges and tunnels and airports and so on. So when we talk about economic development, we shouldn't be talking just about those items, but we should be talking about brain infrastructure as well. Because those highways and bridges and tunnels don't mean anything if there's no one left here to use them, right? if they've all gone elsewhere. So we need to recognize how key that is. Number two, brains are built over time. 
This means that what you do early matters because it affects what happens over time. But it also means that you can't just give up. You can't just say, yay, we funded the first year of life. We did everything you told us to. We can stop now, right? No, you need to keep going, right? You need to support the gains that were made all the way through and part of adulthood. But that also means if we didn't get it right early on, we still have a chance. Brains are built over time. We have a chance to do it later. It's harder. It's more difficult. But it's not impossible. So brains are built over time. There's a three-legged stool for children's development and, and their trajectory for both development and health. One is the biological stuff that we look at all the time in healthcare. These things are important and they matter. But then we recognized it wasn't just the biology. That the socioeconomic environment that a child is born and brought up in matters. In fact, a child's zip code that they live in matters more than their genetic code when it comes to their outcomes. And a few blocks can make a critical difference. And then we realized it wasn't just the broader socioeconomic environment, that there was something else. It was the microenvironment around the child. Who's at home? How are they interacting? Who's in their child care center? Who's in their neighborhood? Those back and forth attachments and relationship patterns matter just as much as the other two things. And that brings me to the third point, that there's two things that affect the wiring of the developing brain, how those neurons are wiring together in those first thousand days of life. And that's your genes and your experiences that you have. And you can't have one without the other. Okay, it's like a campfire. You need that wood and you need that spark to get that fire going. Now, you can't change genes so much. I will have no time to talk about that today. But we can change experiences. And how do we talk about experiences? How do we change those experiences? We do it through the advice we give. We do it through programs we set up and we do it through policies we enact. Those are the levers we can pull. And then if you say, OK, but what is it that's critical? What's the active ingredient that really makes a difference to a child's development and guides how those neurons wire? It's how the child's interacting with others, what we call serve and return, like in tennis, when that ball is served and your partner volleys it back. Those serve and return interactions, those loving, nurturing, mutually responsive interactions that happen are what drive development. In fact, they are just about the only thing that drives development. Okay? If you take nothing away from else from tonight, what drives development is interactions with other people. There is no toy, there is no app, there is no DVD that does anything that's been proven for children under age two in terms of their development or their learning. I don't care what it says on the box or the web ad or anything <laughs> like that. As one of my colleagues once said, there is no app to replace your lap. T-shirts available in the lobby. No. Okay. <laughs> so. But really, parents get anxious. They get worried. They want the best for their children. And they're spending money on these things. They're getting suckered by marketing. Okay. What, you, what a child needs is a loving, responsive adult in front of them. And, and we'll, we'll spend some time talking about that. So to highlight this, I'm going to play a video for you. I used to work for Ed Tronic when I was an undergrad. He's the uh, director of the child development unit at uh, Children's Hospital in Boston. He created this face-to-face -face paradigm that he'll explain. You'll see what happens when these back and forth interactions go well, what happens when they don't go so well for a short period of time, and then the recovery that happens when it's short-lived. I'll let him explain. Whoops, and I don't think we're getting audio here. Give me one moment here. OK. Uh, Babies yeah. this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. And the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother,
to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this, and then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. So I used to code these videotapes as an undergrad. The hard part was not seeing interactions like that. That was what we expected to see, right? The hard part was when the mom would go into the still face and the baby wouldn't do anything. Just mm -hmm. didn't seem bothered by it. Why? Because they weren't used to this back and forth interaction, so they didn't feel the loss of it. Now, I want to be very clear about something. I don't believe for a moment that any of the parents in our studies, or any parents anywhere really, don't love their kids, don't care about them, don't want the best for them. You know, it's, it's universal that parents love their children and want the best for them that no group, socioeconomic, cultural, et cetera, has cornered the market on loving their kids and wanting you know, the best for them. The thing is, we think of this back and forth interaction as being automatic and natural and instinctual. It's not. It's learned behavior. And we learned it from watching other people around us. Right? How do you know how to do peekaboo? That's not hardwired. You saw someone else do peekaboo, and you saw the baby respond, and you tried it yourself, and, you know, and back and forth, and great. But if you're growing up in neighborhoods, environments, cultures, whatever, where interacting with young children doesn't happen routinely for whatever reason, you don't know that. So here's the thing. We've done a really good job as a society of bridging an information gap, right? We have ads on the bus and billboards and other things that say, talk to your child, read to your child, play with your child, sing with your child. Right? We've seen a million of those, right? They're all over the place. And no parent that I've worked with, and I've worked with a lot of families that are in, in underserved populations and so on, I've had no parents in the last five years who, when I say that to them, they look at me in surprise. They've seen the ads. They've seen the brochures. They've seen all this stuff. So we've bridged that information gap. They know it. Here's the problem. We have a skills gap, right? Parent goes home, sits down their six-month-old, starts talking to them. Well, six months old's not going to talk back, right? So you start to feel a little weird, you know, a little stupid, right? What am I doing? And am I saying the right things? Maybe I'm not saying the right things. Oh, you know what? I didn't do so well in school. Maybe, maybe I'm the wrong person to be talking to my child. Maybe I should put them in front of this learning DVD, right? It's made by educators. They'll, th that's better for them. I'll mess them up. Right? You see what happens? So you get in this cycle where the parent says, I'm, I'm not going to do this right, and I don't even know if I can do it right. So what do we need? We need someone to not just bridge the skills gap, but we, to bridge the information gap, but to bridge the skills gap. And that takes someone saying, yeah, modeling it for them, coaching them, just to simply say, yes, you're doing it right. Yes, that's how you should do that, and so on. It's not just about dropping some information on them and handing them a few things and saying, here, go on and do it. You know, can you imagine if we did that in healthcare? Hey, let's go put a central line in that patient. It's fine. Yeah, you'll be okay. Just figure it out. No, that would be terrible. None of us would want that. So why do we expect parents to do this? So we need to think about modeling and coaching and so on. This next point is simple. You need simple circuits and skills in order to do more complex things. So when people say things like, why are we putting money into all this money into children just playing? 
That's what all of these daycares are about, right? They're just playing. What, how expensive can that be? That's a profound misunderstanding of what early childhood education is about. Playing is that child's job because that's how they develop their skills. Play is the work of infancy, as T. Barry Braslin said. So if you want to think of early childhood centers as being early workforce development, be my guest, because that's essentially what it is. This next point, we'll spend a few moments on this idea of toxic stress, and I'll define that more carefully in just a moment. But toxic stress is, is associated with persistent effects on the neuroendocrine system and causes lifelong problems, not just in behavior and, and, uh, and learning and all, but also in very real measures of physical health that we can, we can show you. So if I put up these two head CT scans, you may not know how to read a CT scan. This is two three-year-old kids, and this is a slice to the head kind of looking up, okay? The child on the left is a typically developing child, okay? You can see the, the size of the brain, et cetera, there. The child on the right is a child who underwent extreme emotional neglect, okay? Not physical neglect. They were bathed, they were clothed, they were fed, but there was very little interaction. This is a child from an Eastern European orphanage in the 1980s. Tons of kids, very few staff. Okay? So that made a big difference there. You can see, just without knowing much about a head CT, there's a big difference between these two. That brain on the right is much smaller. It doesn't look as dense with neurons. It's kind of shrunken looking, right? I'm giving you an extreme example because if you can see this without a whole lot of training, Right? You can see how profound the effect is. There's more subtle changes that we'll talk about a little bit later that we can see um, that are in less extreme circumstances. Now, let's talk for a moment about stress in our society. So first of all, is there anyone here who has absolutely zero stress in their lives? Okay, good. I'm glad no one raised their hand because if you did, I'd have to come over and check for a pulse. Okay. Stress is part of being a living being. Okay, It's how we cope with changes in our environment, temperature changes, noise, uh, work stress, you know, family questions, you know, at, at stressed out times, um, new skills that we don't know, uh, you know, sound not working on your computer, you know, all those sorts of things. And how we take that stress and how we deal with it changes over time. Even newborn babies have stress, right? They feel hunger, that's a stress, and they have a stress response to it, and so on. This is part of being a living being. If you have zero stress, you have absolutely zero incentive to change. So nothing happens. If you have too much stress, you get overwhelmed and start coping in maladaptive ways, as you'll see. But somewhere in the middle is a sweet spot, right? Where it's just enough stress that, ah, OK, you can cope, you can learn, you, you adapt, you learn new skills, all those sorts of things. Simplistically, we put out a couple of hormones, epinephrine, cortisol, which is known as the stress hormone. And we often see and use that as a marker for how much stress is happening. So conceptually, we can have three levels of stress. We have positive stress, little bits of stress hormone. This is good. This is how you learn new things. This is how you adapt, et cetera, et cetera. This happens every time I get up to give a talk. And that's great, right? You don't want me falling asleep up here, forgetting what I'm going to say, so on and so forth. Being able to cope when something happens. So when sound didn't work, yes, I've had that happen before, and I knew exactly where to go and look and, and, and fix that quickly. OK? Learn that. So small amounts of stress help. Then we have bigger stressors that are tolerable. These are not minor things. Stress levels go up, but then they come down after a while because the situation improves. And they're buffered by this idea of supportive relationships. The supportive relationships piece is really, really key, as you'll see, because then you have toxic stress. Toxic stress is not necessarily a single bad stressor. It may not even be a worse stressor than tolerable stress, but it's prolonged. It's there for longer periods of time, and there's few or no of those supportive buffering relationships to get in the way. So in a child's life, what if the things are worse? What if they don't have those good buffering supportive <coughs> relationships, right? And there's that relationships piece again. These are things that sadly happen too often. Child abuse, parental substance abuse, homelessness. And these are often prolonged, right? They're not often just these short little snippets and that's it. These are often things that are affecting a child's life over a long period of time. These affect the biology of young children profoundly. And when I say young children, I'm talking about under age five in different ways. So if you're 11 and everything was fine and then bad stuff happens at 11, I'm not going to say it's great, 
But I'm also going to say, guess what? You already have a lot of coping mechanisms and strategies that allow you to deal with it. But a young kid, a one-year-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, their brains are still plastic. They haven't developed a lot of those coping strategies yet. So what happens is it affects their brain in such a way that we call it toxic stress. Because that toxic stress has a profound impact on what happens. So what's the cycle that happens? They have these childhood stressors that occur. That leads to this fight or flight, right? This, this, this cortisol epinephrine release sort of thing to become chronic. It wasn't meant to be chronic. It was meant to deal with when you're walking in the woods and you suddenly see a bear, right? Mortal danger, safety, all those sorts of things. You, re you release more of these hormones. It causes changes in the brain, in the architecture of the brain, what we'll talk about in just a moment. But the upshot is you get a child who has this hyper-responsive stress response. They're not as calm. They can't cope as well. And this is what we see in our preschools and in our homes and so on. And then that feeds into more stress. So think about this. You take two three-year-olds. You take one three-year-old who had a, a loving household, good, responsive, nurturing relationships, very minimal stressors around them, so on. And they go to preschool, and they're in story time, and the preschool teacher, the kid talks out of turn, the preschool and the teacher gets a little frown on their face because the kid's talking out of turn. To this child, oh, yeah, frown on the face. When I see that at home, that means I did something I shouldn't. Oopsie, you know, and they stop talking. No big deal. Then take a child whose home has been filled with witnessing violence, being abused, uh, emotional neglect, uh, so on and so forth, and put them in that same classroom. And that teacher gets that little frown on their face for the same thing, right? Talking out of turn or something. And what happens? To that kid, that doesn't mean, oopsie. It means, uh-oh, something bad's going to happen. I'm going to get hit. Something's going to get thrown. Yelling's going to start. And what do they do? They dive under the table. They run down the hall screaming. They start flailing. They curl up in a ball, you know, and, and shut down. And everyone says, what's wrong with this kid? That's not the right question. The question shouldn't be what's wrong with you. The question should be what happened to you? What happened to you that made that a response that worked for you? That doesn't mean it's OK for the kid to go running down the hall, right? We still need to maintain safety and orderly classrooms and all that stuff. But it helps us start asking the right questions to say, hang on, this kid needs some help, and we need to find the right help and really try to make a difference for them by asking the right questions and figuring out what's going on. So what happens to the brain? Just three areas I want to focus on. And this is work that's been done right here on the UW-Madison campus, actually, by uh, Seth Pollock's lab. The amygdala. The amygdala activates as the stress response, the fear, the survival, all that sort of stuff. The amygdala lights up. It's larger on MRI scans of kids who've had adversity in early in life versus those who haven't. Countering the amygdala are two areas. One is the prefrontal cortex, right? This is your logic. You're thinking through things, what we call executive functioning, planning, delayed gratification, all that stuff. When you do functional MRI, you see less activity in that part of the brain. There's less neural density and so on. And then you have the hippocampus. It plays a big role in memory and mood. The hippocampal volumes are actually smaller, again, in kids who've had that early adversity. So there seem to be some qualitative changes in the brain. Now, this is all well and good. But I'm a primary care pediatrician. I do not go ordering head MRIs on, actually, on almost none of my patients. If specialist wants one, they can get it. But I do not order these. They're expensive and a pain in the neck to get. And honestly, they are not going to change a lot about what I do. And no parent has come in and said, hi, doctor, we're here today to see you because I'm worried that my child's hippocampal volumes are too small. Okay. <laughs> Hasn't happened. Might happen someday. But instead, what I hear is parents come in and they say, I'm worried. School's concerned because there's some things going on with my child. They're impulsive. They can't plan ahead. They're anxious. They can't delay gratification. Their memory's crummy. Their mood's all over the place. So what does this sound a lot like? Well, this sounds like a lot like what we often call ADHD. Now, there are kids with classical ADHD. They're trying. School's trying. Parents are trying. Everyone's trying. Home's supportive, all that stuff. They just can't pay attention, my goodness. Those kids tend to do pretty well, actually, with a relatively small dose of medication. And their grades and performance come up, and they take off and fly. Their self-esteem goes up. Everyone's happy. Great. Wonderful. That is a minority 
of the patients that I see typically in the populations I work with. Oh yeah, we often have them labeled as ADHD and we often are given them medication and all that. But you know what, they still don't do so well. They still struggle. They're still having behavior problems. And then we all keep, we look for the right medicine, we adjust doses and all that, we still never get a satisfactory response. So what I've learned is when I do my evaluations, I start from the beginning, I say to the parents, okay, tell me everything that happened, start prenatally and walk me through their life and tell me what happened and not just what were their APGAR scores and the birth weight and where they were hospitalized and surgeries and all that. Tell me other things. Tell me, were you ever homeless? Was there always enough food to eat in your home? Did your child ever witness domestic violence? Was your child ever the subject of violence? And what do I hear? Yes, 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 and yes. And I realized that by the time I'm seeing this kid at age six or eight or 13 or whatever, the pileup of these stressors that have happened and what I'm thinking to myself is, is this really just ADHD? Or is what I'm seeing the brain changes associated with adversity? It's adversity. Now here's the problem. I nor anyone else has a magic medication to make this go away. There are evidence-based therapies, but we gotta find someone who knows how to do them well, and they do exist. We need to make sure insurance pays for it. And we need, the family has to be able to take advantage of it, right? I have families that look at me and say, I would love to go to this therapy that you're talking about weekly with my child for the next several months to help them get back on track. I nearly got fired from my job just to come here today. I can't commit to weekly, we will lose, I will lose my job, we will lose our home. Right? It's not that the stressors magically just lifted from their lives. So if we can prevent this, then we're, we'll see much better outcomes and results over time. So what happens with, when this adversity occurs? I talked a little bit about it. There's something called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. How many of you have ever heard of this? Yeah, so only a couple of hands, which is why I call this the most important study you've probably never heard of, okay? And even in the medical community, when I do grand rounds and all, people, some, not, I don't get all that many hands, even though this came out in the 90s. This was a landmark large study looked, looking at 17,000 adults that had prior histories of abuse and trauma in childhood and looked to see what happened to them across their lives. Large cohort, really well done. I wanna point out, that this is a study of the middle class, having attended college, mostly Caucasian, et cetera, et cetera, split between men and women evenly. This is not a study of poor people, because people often think, oh, it's a study of adversity, this must be a study of underserved populations. No, this is a study of the general population, which makes the results so astounding. They looked at these different categories of abuse and neglect, okay, and there's certainly more that you could add, but this is what they went with. The numbers appearing on the right, are the prevalence of these things in this population. Just look at these numbers for a moment. These are sky high, okay? 26% said they were physically abused at some point during their childhood. A quarter of middle class people who went to college and all that stuff, right? Even 6%, that's one in 20. These are really, really high numbers. And this, these numbers are not a fluke. They have repeated the ACEs study over and over. They've done state-specific ACEs studies. Wisconsin actually has several cohorts work that they've done. And they're finding about the same numbers over and over and over again. I was even at a conference for uh, childhood abuse and trauma, gave a talk much like this one. And at the break, they handed out those little audience response clickers because they're anonymous and did the 10 questions with them, the 10 categories the numbers for people in the room around us were eerily similar to these. So this is very common. Now you can't measure intensity, right? How do you say one person's abuse is worse than someone else's? And you know, that this, there's not a way you can really quantify that. But you can give them a point for each of these categories, right? You can add up categories. And that's how they came up with something called an ACE score. They gave one point for each category listed. And 26% had just one, but four or five or six categories, about one in 20 for each of those. And they found that there was kind of a cumulative effect that happened. So just to show you a couple of things, this is your risk of developmental delay compared to your ACE score. If you had five, six or seven adverse childhood experiences, you had 75 to nearly 100% chance 
of having developmental delay in the first three years of life. And developmental delay is tough, right? You got to take all this time to put things together, you know, assess, screen, assess, um, you know, diagnose, therapy, all those, all those things. Okay, so big difference compared to one or two ACEs, almost none. This one blew my mind when I first saw it. This is your risk for adult heart disease. Seven or eight adverse childhood experiences triples, triples your risk for heart disease as an adult compared to someone who had none. Tripling of odds. And I could show you another 50 slides for a variety of conditions, mental health, learning issues, um, and other medical issues as well. What happens early matters. But if we create the right conditions, coming back to that report, the last point they made was, if we create the right conditions for early childhood development, it's more effective and less costly than trying to figure it out later on. So if you think about a child's trajectory from birth to kindergarten entry, you got the kids who are on the healthy trajectory. We want them to stay there. You got the kids that we can label as high risk, right? The X 26 week preemie. We know they're at high risk. You could say, do stuff for them. And then you got the kids that we can't label so easily who we call at risk. There's many more of them out there and they also won't do so well. Here's the thing, adversity pushes down on all these curves. It's not that you're magically immune. So we need good protective interventions to shield children from the effect of the adversity. And that's through those protective relationships and so on. So what are the sorts of things we can do? Well, for healthy kids, good anticipatory guidance, proper reading together, proper discipline, good health services, preschool, etc. For the kids who are at risk, you do all of that. Plus, you can do parental responsiveness training. Right? The parent who doesn't know how to do the face-to-face -face play, we can model that and do it. And it's not that hard to show it a few times. And they get it. They pick it up very quickly. Good language stimulation from people, not products. They need to hear words from people around them. The TV doesn't count. And good high-quality early childhood education. And then the highest-risk kids, all of that, plus home visiting, specialized services, and so on. Because as Jack Shankoff at the Harvard Center on the Developing Child says, there's a few ways we can really make a difference. One, we need to reduce the emotional and behavioral barriers to learning. This is actually absolutely huge. I have tons of kids I have worked with who are absolutely brilliant. They have fantastic intellect and they are flunking out of school. This is a problem not just for that kid or that family or that neighborhood or me or the community. This is a problem for us as a society. Why? Because if that kid had gotten the right conditions, what might that intellect have produced for all of us? Might they have figured out how to cure cancer? Or get us to Mars? Or world peace? Right? Which kid might have figured out Alzheimer's and how to, how to address that? Which might affect us, or our kids, or our grandkids, or whatever. This is like leaving oil on the ground. We're just saying, forget this natural resource of this powerful intellect there, because we can't be bothered to provide the right support. Okay? We all lose out when those kids don't do so well. Number two, children live in families. I know that seems obvious, but people forget. You can't transform the lives of children if you don't transform the lives of their parents. Who am I to tell a parent they should be reading to their child every night when they look at me and say, I can't. I'm at, I'm at my second job because that's how we make ends meet. Okay? You don't give people a living wage, well, this is the fallout. I just talked to a reporter today about, about family leave and pointed out that family leave is one of those things that helps these strong supportive relationships build in those first critical thousand days of life that mean we spend less money later on on rehab and remediation and so on. It actually pays off. But people don't see that. They just see that as, oh, you're just at home vacationing with your child. Yes, because parenting is a vacation, right? Uh, no, it isn't. I have teenagers. It's not a vacation. Okay. And then health and well-being is not just medicine's job. It's everyone's job. Because as the UW Population Health Institute reminds us, of all the different things, all the different health factors that play into health outcomes, only 20% is clinical care. The rest is health behaviors, it's social and economic factors, and it's physical environment. So it's much broader than just the health world. So a few numbers to remember. There's 700 new neural connections happening per second in the developing brain. We want those to happen well because brain plasticity is, ter is important, and brain plasticity changes. Um, we lose cellular plasticity, by by, or the beginnings of cellular plasticity by the time they hit kindergarten. Number two, we can measure disparities in vocabulary as early as 18 months. 
Okay, three different socioeconomic groups in this graph. The bottom is the age from 10 months to 36 months. The vertical is their cumulative receptive vocabulary, their ability to understand words. And you can see right here, the richest kids are already pulling away from their less affluent peers. The middle class kids by two years are pulling away. The achievement gap is not an issue of middle schools not doing their job right. It's not an issue of elementary schools not doing their job right, or even preschools. Preschool is off the right, end, right side of this graph. If we can measure it here in toddlerhood, you know darn well those brain changes started in infancy. We will fix the achievement gap when we do serious and substantial investment in the first thousand days of life. This is why I get troubled by the focus sometimes we see on summer slide and all that. Those are important, don't get me wrong. I think we need to do that, but we need to look at the roots of why are kids losing their reading across the summers so easily when they don't have a strong foundation in reading early on and so on. Okay, we need to be going early, early, early if we're going to figure this out. Because for every dollar we put into early childhood, we're seeing four to nine dollars in returns. Who says that? Folks like James Heckman, who's a Nobel laureate in, in economics at the University of Chicago. He's made this his life's work. The Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank has reports saying similar things as well. And Frederick Douglass told us long before we had MRIs and all that, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Okay, so now that I've depressed everyone thoroughly, what can we do about all this? I will give you the solution. Well, not really. I'll give you principles of solutions. Because this is a complex issue, right, with a lot of moving parts and a lot of different factors that play into it. So what do we need? We need solutions that do a bunch of things. We need to build capabilities, right? The parent who doesn't know how to do face-to-face -face play, we can teach them that. We can show them how to do that. We need to build capacity. They might say, yes, I know how to do all this, but I'm working my second job. I can't be there for my child in the evening, or I'm exhausted because my diabetes is out of control because I have no health insurance, right? Okay, fix those things and help lift some of that burden off that parent so they can do the good job of parenting that they want to do and that they know how to do. We need to do things that are based in homes and communities. Don't make them trek across town to campus, right? Do things right where they are because that reduces the burden and load on them that they're already experiencing. I had a parent just this afternoon who showed up a half an hour late. They were the last patient of the day, of course. Half hour late, and I said, yes, we'll see them, because I know that family, I know how much stress that mother's under, and she has to take two or three buses just to get to, her, get to us. She's doing the best she can. And I said, yes, we will, we will stay here and we will see you, because I know that for her to come back would be absolutely massive. We need to address root causes, right? Don't just say, hey, yeah, we, make, we made some test scores change. No, did you actually make the kids, kid and their family's life better? We need to have long-term effects, use a prevention mindset. We wanna leverage those key first thousand days of life. We wanna use things that are evidence-guided. You notice I don't say evidence-based. If you only do things in pediatrics that are evidence-based, you will do the same 12 things over and over. We don't have as broad a research base as we'd like. So yes, do more research. Yes, build out that evidence base. But funders who insist on solely evidence-based stuff are gonna get the same thing repeated over and over and over, and they're gonna see no innovation as a result. Okay, so we need to use, try common sense, try a little you know, experimentation, see what might work. And then finally, we need things that are scalable. This is the hard part. We have some great pro programs that work really well. Home visiting, for example. Home visiting is fantastic, has great outcomes, great evidence base. It's expensive per family, so we can't scale it out. So yes, we should fund home visiting more. I completely agree with that. I've written newspaper columns saying we should do that, right? But we also need to think we're never gonna be able to scale home visiting to reach everyone who needs it. So what can we do also that we can take to scale? So, if we want to have good, productive, happy adults, right, who are able to participate fully in society and all, how do we get to that? Well, we need them to be educationally successful. Okay, great, so how do we get to that? We need brain circuitry primed for school success, as I've just laid out for you. Okay, so how does that happen? It's through those early experiences we talked about. And how does that happen? It's from those nurturing, responsive interactions when they're young children. Again, all as we said. So how do you get that? Well, you need it through adults who can put the skills into action, you know, that have that ability, and making sure they have the capability and capacity to do all those things. So how do we get to that? Ultimately, it's through the advice, the programs, and the policies we set up. And that ultimately is the chain of things that we're trying to set off here. It's a whole chain of things that will happen and happen well if we get it right early on. 
So we can do things like home visiting, which are intensive, but because they're expensive, small initiatives. Or we can also do broader but scalable larger initiatives that maybe don't have as much impact but can hit a large amount of the population and all. So an example of a broader initiative is one that I'm associated with called Reach Out and Read. So I showed you that back and forth um, uh, parent-child interaction video that was filmed there. Down the hall from uh, where I was working as a research assistant was the primary care clinic at Boston City Hospital and I heard about this little tiny program where they were giving out books to children and telling them to read at their checkups and telling families to read to their children and so on. That was actually where Reach Out and Read was born. It's now in all 50 states, 6,000 clinics serving 6 million children, blah, blah, blah. Um, Reach Out and Read is an early literacy program that runs out of clinics, primary care clinics, using the checkup, the regular checkup that people are already coming to and adding in a literacy component to that and, and, and advice and all. And here's the thing, we say it's an early literacy program, it's actually not really that, it's, it is kind of that, but it's really a parenting program, right? And we're trying to skill build for parents, how can they read effectively with their young child so we can get to those nurturing responsive interactions and familiarity with books and text and all that stuff. And if I had to summarize the whole thing in a single graphic, it would be this item here, the prescription to read. I actually hand these out in clinic. I give them at the state capitol and at the <laughs> capitol in DC when I do advocacy for Reach Out and Read because I really mean this, because of all the stuff I've told you today. This may be the most important prescription I ever hand a family because if this works, so to speak, that child is set on the path for lifelong success and that lifelong success means better health, better outcomes, better well-being for them all the way throughout their life, including adulthood. So this is really important. I won't, I won't dwell on the model, but I want to say it's kind of like Reach Out and Read and programs like it are like the elephant and the blind men, right, who are all touching and feeling different parts of the elephant. And, you know, because people see different things when it comes to Reach Out and Read. People say, oh, you're giving away books to kids in clinic. That's wonderful. I say, yes, we're doing that. But you know what? We're also doing all sorts of other things. Because I walk in with the book in my hand, and I give it directly to the child. Me, not the nurse, not the receptionist or anything, because I want to see what is that child doing with the book? How are they manipulating it? How are they interacting? Are they saying words? Are they pointing at things? Do they hold it out to their parent in that read to me gesture? Oh, they tell me volumes when they do that because they're saying, I know what this thing is. This is that thing that if I go up to my parent and if I hold it out, I trust that they're going to pull me up into their lap and open it and we're going to spend some time looking at it together. Right? I know about home life and all those sorts of things. So not only is it a book giveaway, it's an educational intervention, right? Get them familiar with the concepts of text and so on early on so we, we set them off to a good educational path early. It's a way for me to look at their development, look for language, find motor skills, et cetera, et cetera. Even gross motor skills when they run across the room to grab the book from my hand, right? I can do the, all these parts of my job much easier. <coughs> I can build parental capacity by showing them how to effectively read with their young child at a young age. There's a technique called dialogic reading that, that we can show parents. We don't call it that because it sounds technical and scary, but we show them how to read to that squirmy toddler because some parents aren't really sure how to do that and they get easily discouraged. We buffers toxic stress, that few moments in the evening of having your child tucked in next to you and being able to just share books together. It's a way to assess relationships in the family a public health approach, and it's a scalable, evidence-based, there's actually a strong published evidence-based model. So ultimately, programs like Reach and Read are not just any one of these things. They really are, it's all of these things. And we can do it cheaply and easily through an existing network of clinics that already are doing, that people are bringing their kids to, in a universe, near universal, non-stigmatized fashion. And if you want to know more about uh, these various facets of Reach Out and Read, a colleague and I actually wrote a report called The Elephant in the Clinic. Um, free download from online. This URL actually might be broken. I need to fix that. But if you go to Google and type in The Elephant in the Clinic, the page pops right up. Free PDF download. It is um, a, a co-publication of Reach Out and Read National Center and uh, uh, Aspen Ascend, which is a two-generation fellows program that, that I'm in. When I moved here in 2006, there was about 30 clinics in the state doing Reach Out and Read. They worked with National Center. There was no statewide coordinating body to kind of help training, technical assistance, so on. I got a few things started here. There was one in Dane County, believe it or not, only one clinic. 
which shocked me, right? Dang, Madison, come on, you know? By the time we hit 2010, we had gotten up to about 50 clinics, about 10, 11 clinics in Dane, and then we founded Reach Out and Read Wisconsin, which is our statewide coordinating body, a program of the Children's Health Alliance of Wisconsin, and boy, have we been busy. So in that time, we have gone from 55 to, we're actually at 210 as of uh, this month, and so on, serving almost a quarter of children in the state. Clinics are flocking. I mean, clinics are busy, right? They're not looking for new programs. They are like banging on our doors. I had one, one colleague actually email me like every two weeks saying, so when can, we, when can you get us set up? When can you get us set up? Because they're seeing how well this works. So I wanted to share Reach Out and Read as that example. It's not merely advice or a book giveaway. It's a process of parental skill building and support and modeling and saying to them, you're doing it right. And, and having them say, ah, I get it. And we're using already existing skilled trusted professionals to deliver this message. So there's a lot of programs out there that get books to kids. That's great. But if the family doesn't really know how to use them effectively, I don't know what the efficacy of those programs are. We need to make sure that they're getting that modeling, that coaching, and so on. And that's really what's critical. And again, we have an evidence base for that. So to wrap this all up, thinking about early brain and child development, I like to use this sort of public health model of thinking about how we can build healthy brains. We know kids are going to fall, and we need a net to catch them. The first net is a big net. It's also got some big holes. But this is what everyone gets. These are your primary preventions, your guidance, your, your reach out and reads, your, so, your high quality child care, et cetera. The kids who fall through there, we need, a, we need a net to catch them. This net has smaller holes. This is your screening net, your targeted interventions, your head starts, your home visiting, your early intervention, et cetera. And hopefully we catch most of the kids that do fall through at that still going to be a few because this isn't a perfect system. For that, you bring out your smallest net. This is an expensive net, so you can't do it big. But you hope there's only very few kids making it down to the treatment net. All these levels are necessary. None on their own are sufficient. You can't just do the top one or the bottom one alone. You need to have it in this stepwise fashion. So why did I start today by reading to you from the dot? Because that story is actually a story of relationships. It's a story about support. It's a story about trust. You know, the teacher could have said, Vashti, you need to have a better attitude, and you better get that assignment turned in, right? And Vashti's going to be like, yeah, great. Instead, she took that one dot she could take, make and celebrated it and said, I trust you. I believe in you. I'm going to support you. I'm just going to go with it. You're having a bad day. And everything flourished. Her teacher didn't tell her how to mix the colors and all that stuff. She figured that all out. And then something else happened. We don't know if it was intentional skill building because we're not inside that teacher's head. But Vashti turned around and mentored someone else doing that. Right? So you see the chain of what happens. She built that skill in Vashti, whether Vashti realized it or not, to say, how do you help someone else? And that's why I love that, that story, because it, it takes so many of these principles and puts it together in this deceptively simple um, type of story. I want to play a video for you from the Ounce of Prevention Fund, which is based in Chicago, which really highlights what happens in the first five years, the many stressors that affect so many children in our society. Nearly half of US children live under 200% of the federal poverty line. Please do remember that. And then what we can do that makes a difference for them. <clears throat> That's me at four months old. I'm one of the thousands of little miracles born into poverty every day. That's my mom. She's 17 and never finished high school. She's got some big dreams for me, but she's alone and she's scared. This is my first birthday. That's my grandma. My cousin Tanya and her boyfriend Kevin. We all live together. It's cold and crowded. I hope we move soon. I don't like Kevin. He's always yelling. This is my second birthday. We're all at daycare. Strapped in watching TV again. I wish I could just run around. This is my third birthday. My brother William's taking care of me while my mom sleeps. She works the night shift, so I can't turn up the TV. 
but we get to go to bed whenever we want. This is my fourth birthday. We're sleeping in my aunt's this month. I don't know when my dad's coming home, but I'm hungry and I miss him. This is my fifth birthday. This is my first day of kindergarten. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm unprepared. Because I didn't get the right start. I'm twice as likely to be in special education. 30% more likely to never go to college. 70% more likely to be arrested for a violent crime. Become a teen parent. Drop out of school. Never hold a job. Spend the rest of my life in poverty. My mom plays with me all the time. She smiles a lot now, and she knows she's not alone anymore. Grandma, Tanya, and Kevin read me a story every night before I go to bed. I go to my school every day, where I get to run and play and see all of my new friends. Will and I go to preschool together. Today we learned about dinosaurs and played a counting game. Every morning, my dad and I brush our teeth and eat breakfast together. We have our own place now, and I know we'll always be together. This is my first day of kindergarten. I'm rested, I'm eager, I'm confident, I'm curious, I'm prepared. I'm ready. I am your future. Change the first five years, and you change everything. Anyone interested in investing? I think he's available for keynote addresses and things like that. I want to close with this quote from the Sutton Trust, which is based in the United Kingdom, but I, I think it's very apt for us as well. While schools can do much to raise achievement among children who initially lag behind their peers, all too often preschool gaps set and train a patter, pattern of ever-increasing inequality during school years and beyond. Any drive to improve social mobility must begin with an effective strategy to nurture the fledgling talent in young children so often lost before it has had a chance to flourish. This is why I do this work. This is what I see with my patients. This is what I see in communities that fledgling talent often doesn't have a chance to fly. So whatever we can do to support children, support parents in these sorts of roles is important. And I always close with this. This is a picture of my wife reading to my son. I caught them in this moment years ago of being lost in a book together. It reminds me that children are made readers in the laps of their parents, but also that parents are their child's first and best teachers. We need to nurture them in that role, let them see themselves in that role, and support them in that role as much as possible, because that is where we will ultimately see the best payoff overall. Up there, my uh, campus email address, as well as uh, social media that's public facing. You're welcome to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. I post things about child health, advocacy, policy, children's books, et cetera, et cetera. So feel free to, to follow along on any of those. So thank you for your attention tonight, and now I can take questions from folks. Thank you. It's a good question. So, um, the, you know, the, I think that, you know, we get, we get complex in terms of the things that are out there. We, we start trying to measure everything. We start trying to, um, you know, do very complicated evaluation sometimes, and we don't necessarily pull back and say, let's keep this simple. What are the types of support that people need? What are the sorts of things that, we can, that they can show us about what they value and how they value it? and move on from there. I think sometimes we make things more complicated than they need to be. 
This is even true in pediatrics. I even said, I said to a medical student like yesterday, I said, I think you're overthinking this. Just look at the child and tell me what you see. Okay, forget everything we've taught you for a moment and just look at the child. And he told me, I said, yes, and there's your answer. You know, so I think sometimes we forget. It's like that old Zen, the beginner's mind thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, have there been any studies that um, compare and contrast whether culture has a role and whether an industrialized nation versus an unindustrialized nation uh, mm -hmm. matters? So you're asking about culture versus industrialization as well? Um, or not versus, but and? Yes. Yeah, okay. So there are some cult, sure, yeah, certainly happy, happy to. Um, there, there's some good work about cultural differences in interactional style, which is, which is the first part of your question. Does that matter? So um, Shirley Bryce Heath uh, did some excellent studies of looking at cultural differences in the United States uh, in terms of reading behaviors. And what, they, what she found was um, that there were, there were different methods of, tra of oral, of, of storytelling, right? So for example, they looked in North Carolina in three different communities. The upper middle class Caucasian community often did um, picture book reading, right? And they let the child interrupt and whatnot when they were young and you know, they were socialized to kind of interrupt less as they went along and, and so on. But it was about picture books, it was about enjoying books, the stories, narrative flow, all those sorts of things. The more working class Caucasian families uh, that she studied, they looked at books too, but a lot of it was more drills and skills. Know your letters, know your numbers, what are the colors, that sort of thing. Very little about picture books and stories and all. Much more utilitarian, almost, way of going about it. And then she looked at um, uh, African American low income, uh, a, an African American low income community, mm -hmm. and found a rich, wonderful storytelling tradition but it was primarily oral, right? Al along with some old call and response type things in which the listeners were encouraged to actually um, sometimes interrupt the storyteller, right? As part of the back and forth. This is all fine and, and great. Can you imagine what happens when you put these kids into school, right? You got the ones who've been socialized to sit and listen to stories and all that who do fine. And then you got the kid who interrupts the, the, the person speaking and gets called a smart aleck and is a behavior problem. But wait a minute, but that's what they were doing at home and it was part of a rich storytelling tradition. So we had to be careful, careful around culture. I also do want to say though that remember in our society that print is one of the dominant ways of conveying information. So whether reading or writing is part of a cultural tradition, well, it's what we're growing up in here and what we need for, for educational success. So we want to, we want to bring that on top. I will say that the books we provide to Reach Out and Read are, as much as we can, rich and diverse culturally, linguistically, um, in terms of the depictions in them, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I think there's a lot of different, different elements to it there. Um, the second part of your question beyond culture was, remind me, oh, industrialization, yes. About, what about industrialization? I, I don't know. Um, you know. One of the interesting things is that if you look at the history of children's books, we didn't really see a flourishing of children's books in, in a big way until um, probably, let's say, the 1940s or so, and then moving on. And part of that was actually because of immunizations and antibiotics. Kids lived beyond age five. We had to remember that just 100 years ago, how many children died before their fifth birthday. So to invest in their brain development was not considered you know, a wise investment of time and resources when so many of those kids would die. But then immunizations dropped the death rate, good public health and hygiene dropped the death rate, and antibiotics dropped the death rate. So now all of a sudden you saw books appearing for young children finally because now it made sense to actually do things. So modern technology actually probably helped a lot of these things. I'm not even going to touch digital media right now. I have a whole talk on that. Bring me back some time for that one, um, yeah, and, and so on. But the I don't know. And, and then, of course, industrialization also changed work patterns, you know, factory work shifts, et cetera. And how does that affect the ability to parent? And that's a whole different kettle of fish. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was more interested in kind of like the how work patterns and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that, I mean, I, I point out to medical students and residents all the time that when you talk to a parent and you ask about a child's bedtime and they say, well, my children go to sleep at 1 a.m., 
many of us, right, will have this bristling, like, 1 a.m., my goodness, what sort of, do you have any control over your kids? 1 a.m., that's ridiculous. Well, guess what? Most of the time when I hear that, the parents say to me, yeah, we work shifts that if, we, if our kids aren't up late, we'll never see them. And their kids aren't going anywhere in the morning as long as they're getting good total sleep, like they're waking up 10, 11 a.m., that's fine. When they get close to school entry, I say, okay, you'll need to start adjusting their bedtime, but who am I to tell them that their kids should go to bed at an earlier time when they're getting good total sleep and they just want to see their children? They want to build that strong relationship with them and, and spend time with them. That's okay. And my notions, my privileged notions of when you should go to bed should not, be, should not drive the advice I give. I should be flexible in, in what's there because this is the reality many parents have. Yes, ma'am. For Reach Out and Read, how are the books funded? Um, uh, if you see one Reach Out and Read program's funding, you have seen one Reach Out and Read program's funding. Uh, they really go all over the place. So in Wisconsin, um, I can say that we have entities that are putting it in their budget. So for example, UW Health took me eight years, but it got written into the budget, and it comes. It's it's part of. Say, they said this is part of how we provide high quality health care. So we're going to treat this the same as we would any other medical supply, which it, it, it is. Um, other clinics, it's a little tougher. Um, small clinics will actually sometimes hold fundraisers, bake sales, et cetera, to buy the books. The books are bought at literacy rates, which are really, really inexpensive. So I love it when people say, oh, we want to hold a book drive. But inside, I'm like, um, money, we can make your money go a lot further with our sources than you buying books for us You know, at, re at retail cost. Um, sometimes people will do grants, they'll do fundraising and other sources, uh, et cetera. The books are all brand new. They're developmentally, culturally, all that stuff appropriate. And we want to be able to purchase the books that we want for the program because there's a lot of children's books that aren't so good. We do tell clinics, keep a stash of you know, gently used books for the kid who comes in, not for a checkup, but like an ear infection and you know you see them and do everything and at the end they look at you, where's my book? How can you say no to that, right? So we keep books for that or for the sibling who's along for the visit and is trying to like rip their younger brother's book from their hand, you know, uh, and, and, and so on. But uh, we want the Reach Out and Read books themselves to be new. There used to be federal funding for Reach Out and Read National Center, which had some flow through to the states. Uh, that disappeared several years ago when we got rid of earmarks. It was considered an earmark, so it just disappeared. It had nothing to do with the value or worthiness of the program. It's a program that's in all 50 states, so. Um, but it disappeared. We have been trying to get something back. We had a um, funding bill in the state legislature here uh, this session, made it through the assembly committee, but did not, the Senate committee never brought it up for uh, a hearing. Not sure why. Maybe next time. Yeah. So a lot of different sources, uh, the, uh, depending on the clinics. Yes, sir. Well, go back to your earlier answer. So, so historically, what happened to these kids before 1940 without any children's books? How did they mm -hmm. learn to read? And what, what is, mm -hmm. how does that, uh, what is, how does that uh, go to your paradigm historically? Yeah, so the question is, what happened to these kids before 1940 when there weren't so many children's books around? And there were some books around. They often were just simple alphabet primers, or they were often religious books, right? Because if you think your child might not make it, you know, saying, well, I want them to at least learn something about salvation or whatever, you know, religious system or, or thought you're using. And that's often what the books are centered around. The thing is, things, things were different in terms of expectations, right? We didn't expect children to start necessarily learning to read till a little bit later on uh, in the school system. And also, we had a wider variety of jobs in our society that didn't require good reading fluency. You know, so you could do things. So for example, I take the, what if you have a child who's really good with spatial relations, how things fit together, good with their hands, all that, right? They may actually be a talented auto mechanic, right? They may be able to figure out all sorts of issues. But look at cars today. Cars themselves have changed, right? What do you, you bring it in, what do they do? They're hooking it up to a computer. The manuals are this thick, you know, just to figure out some of the repairs and so on. We've become a more text and information and, and computerized society in many ways. So the total universe of jobs available to a poor reader has shrunk steadily since, since that time. So we had all those, we, that's really what happened is that there used to be much more um, uh, labor, agrarian, other things that didn't necessarily require literacy. I mean, look at how farms have changed, you know, in terms of the technology being used to assess yields and all that. 
Um, that also is, is very different and requires much more of an ability and a fluency to be able to read and succeed in school. And that's just changed over the last several decades, really, uh, over time. So there was a lot more options available to, to children who didn't get those great starts. And now we're trying to pack more and more in. Now, we can also, there's also the whole landmine of, land, land, minefield of, of, you know, what are we teaching young kids in education systems and so on. And that's probably at least five weeks worth of, of, uh, of round the clock conversation in and of itself um, as, as well. We aren't trying to teach kids to read early with Read, Shut, and Read. Okay, I'm not, ha I'm not impressed by the two-year-old who's hauling in a copy of Harry Potter or whatever, right? <laughs> we are trying to teach them to have a love of reading and to understand early that text is conveying information. And when we can do all that, the rest tends to follow as long as nothing else gets in the way, right? Dyslexia is and vision trouble and all that aside, right? But I worry about the child who doesn't learn to read well because they've not ever been exposed to books. I see that all the time, and that's a concern. Anything else? Sir? Uh, I was struck by your argument right at the beginning uh, that we should look at developing brains and developing minds as developing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, our colleagues across the street at Wharf have started in the last two weeks an uh, initiative on innovation in the Wisconsin idea. Mm -hmm. Their emphasis is on industrial innovation with things that you can monetize. Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to write one of those essays that they've been putting out about the Wisconsin idea mm -hmm. on things you might not be able to monetize? Yeah, certainly, because I think that the point here is that, so I, 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 I I'm slightly tooting my own horn only because you've kind of opened the door on it here, but when I came here in 2006, right, there was one struggling reach out and read program in this county. Like, it just hadn't been picked up here for, for, for whatever reason. Because of the training I had from before and the support I had here from my department chair and all, I mean, sometimes people look that you want to talk about children's books in pediatrics? That how does that work? Well, okay, that's how it works. I gave you that talk, right? You know, and now people don't think twice about it, right? In fact, we're having trainees finish their training and go into jobs and saying, wait, your clinic doesn't have reach and read? Why do you not have reach and read? I thought everyone did reach and read. How can you practice like this? You know, we've had that happen. So I think recognizing that a supportive academic mission of something like the university and being able to base, you know, so Reach and Read Wisconsin is actually, it's a program of the Children's Health Alliance of Wisconsin, but its, its initial funding came as a co-project of the Children's Hospital in Milwaukee and the Children's Hospital here. And they both put dollars together to say, we see this. I'm the founding medical director. We got some staff going who are doing the training, the technical assistance, and going throughout the state to the 210 plus clinics. So we actually have our fingers in like a ton of Wisconsin counties, and we are helping them figure out what, are the, what do they have on the ground, right? Sometimes clinics are talking to live public libraries in their town for the first time about how they can work together. Because the clinic's saying, we don't know how to choose the right books, and the public library's like, we know how to do that, <laughs> you know? And can we put a display and put some books in a reading nook in your waiting room? Sure, you can do that, right? They're talking to each other. We're, we're, we're helping them just find the capacity in their own communities. It's not us coming in and telling them how to do it. And we've seen some other fantastic innovations. Appleton, the Appleton Public Library did a couple of talks like this. They said, this is incredible. We have no reach and read programs anywhere in the Fox Valley. We want in on this. They talked to United Way up there, got funding from them, and they did a beautiful model where the library is actually running reach out and read essentially for us. They're kind of a subcontractor in a sense in the Fox Valley, and they've been having tremendous success in, in doing that. So we're able to take the stuff that I've been supported, you know, in part to be able to think about and do and whatnot, and really diffuse that throughout the state. I've gone to many tribal clinics. I have, I have a close connection with the St. Croix Chippewa. I've been up to the Red Cliff and so on, and we're helping them get rolling in this because we know how dismal the graduation rates are for many Native youth. Okay, so what can we do to help with that? with culturally appropriate books. We even found some books in Chippewa, in Ojibwe. 
You know, we even managed to get those on there. So that way, it's like, great, here, it's your language, great, wonderful, uh, and so on. So I think, and, and people are starting to recognize, if we get it right for children, if we get all this stuff going right, this is your future workforce. This is also a big impact on your current workforce. If your <laughs> workers have to leave all the time because they're getting calls from school about behavior or learning or whatever problems, they're less efficient. They're distracted. They're not thinking as much about the work they need to do. Right? This is good for everyone when we get this right. It's good for the families. It's good for the children. It's good for industry. It's good for government. It's good for academia. It's good for all of us, especially when we move out of our ivory towers and talk to other people out there. Sir. So to follow up on Tom's point, I'm looking at the county health rankings, yeah. Pat Remington's. Does he have uh, your reading as a metric in there? So can we go to the counties and mm -hmm. see where their reading is and how that, uh, uh, to evaluate your program and, and what the correlation is? I don't think there's a, a direct reading metric necessarily. There's a metric on education. And I, I have a funny story about the county health rankings and Reach Out and Read. When they first released the county health rankings, um, I think it was uh, Juneau County that was um, the lowest on the list that first year. And uh, Pat tells this story about how he got called up there to explain this and everything. And, and honestly, the, 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 the community was embarrassed. They didn't want to be last in the state. So they said, look, education is one of the things we got hit on here. And they called together all the people they could, and they said, what can we do about this? And four clinics in that county said, well, we do health, not education, but we heard about this program called Reach Out and Read. We'll do our part by implementing it. So they actually were early implementers because the county health ranking spurred them to. So I should actually chat with Pat again about whether we can drill down some more specific metrics. I want to be careful of not just letting, you know, reading scores drive this as well, right? Because so we also we are doing some our own research with the clinics we're in or clinics that are in application to see how much of it is literacy orientation you know, in families and all. I don't want our final, because there's so many things also that drive, can a child read at grade level by X point? And if we say, oh, we, we're gonna bump those scores up, eh, we're 10 visits across four and a half years. We're also dirt cheap, we're 50 bucks per kid per, 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 per year as an intervention, right? So I don't wanna promise the moon. I'm not saying that we will fix everything with programs like Reach Out and Read, but if we can make it part of a series of supports of messages to families to help with this mutually responsive nurturing relationships and interactions that they need with their parents and other loved ones, then we can do this. Then we can push that. And we can hopefully have the, the, the clinics thinking more about this. What are they doing to support relational health and looking for these sorts of things and not just going down a checklist on their, on their, on their EMR saying, you know, you know, do you have a car seat and do this? Those are important, but I think there's other things that we're, we're, we're ignoring sometimes. Thank you for that question. One more? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Is as telemedicine has become more prevalent, mm -hmm. has it moved the needle at all on the scalability issue? Mm -hmm. Or is it effective for parent training or mm -hmm. more intensive interventions? Mm -hmm. well, the question is about telemedicine and does that move the needle or does it is it effective for parent training or things like that? You know, um, we've seen some great innovation. There's some programs, like there's an app called Room that's funded by the Bezos Family Foundation, and I know some of the people who, the, the experts that have had input into that. And that's an app you download for free, and it does some modeling and teaching and whatever. I think it helps offload some of those tasks. It's really hard to replace a person in front of you, looking at what you're doing and saying, yes, you're doing it right, or that's good, why don't you try this? you know, or that. Um, and sometimes there's nuance. I had a dad once who came in with a six month old and, and uh, I asked about, um, I, so at four months there's a question I ask all parents. I, I just do it at four months. And, and the question is, what do you hope, what are your hopes and dreams for what your child is like 20 years from now? Right? And I, I just, then I do something which is very hard for doctors, which is to shut up and listen. <laughs> and I listen and then, you know, they give me 10, 20, 30 seconds worth of stuff. I hope they're in college, I hope they're happy, I hope they're educated, all that, you know. Usually I have a good vision. I say, great, that's wonderful. Now tell me, what are you doing now that you think might help your child achieve that vision that you just laid out? Right? And many will say, I talk to them, I read to them, I sing with them. And this one dad, he said to me so proudly, oh, I watch ABC videos with her on YouTube. 
turn, right? He was so proud of this, and, and the thing is, and of course inside I'm going, no, don't put your kid in front of his screen, right? But if I tell him that, is he ever gonna tell me anything again? No. Yeah. Because he's gonna walk out saying, right, I felt like a heel. That doctor made me feel bad, right? So instead I said, that's so wonderful that you care about your child's learning at this young age. Let me suggest something. They don't learn anything from those videos unless you go over it with them, is what the studies have shown. So it's not the video, it's actually you. Get ABC books in the library, read those with her, and then you're golden. And he was so happy. He said, thanks, I'll do exactly that, right? I took that energy and that drive he had and managed to turn it. I don't know how you get technology to do that, right? I could do that remotely, sure, but it's not an issue of the remoteness. The issue here is the touches, the people working with them, and so on. And I don't know that AI is anywhere near being able to do that and do that well. So we have some things that will augment, but we can't replace. I think there's a lot of folks who think, oh, we'll be able to replace doctors completely in the next 30 years. I'm like, hey, yeah, good luck with that. We're, <laughs> we're still using fax machines for crying out loud, you know? <laughs> you know? So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir? Would you say that um, many or most pediatricians will uh, coach the parents in those early times to tell them about the face time and the mm -hmm. play? I mean, I wonder if kids coming out of high school would know that on their own. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't, is it, not that it's doctors' responsibilities, but is it done? Is mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. generally that's what pediatricians do? Mm -hmm. when, they, mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. look at the baby, then you talk about, by mm -hmm. the way, are you, is that what's happening? Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, is this a pediatrician's job to talk about responsiveness and you know coaching and modeling? The answer, at least in this time, in this current era, is yes. Um, we you, yes, we don't expect a kid coming out of high school to to know this. Yeah, there's some parenting classes and health classes cover some of this, but not really. And I don't expect them to remember much. I actually teach a class on Saturdays to 13-year-olds about human relationships and sexuality. I know they're not going to remember a ton of this stuff. We're hoping that they at least walk away with some of the core concepts and they can come back to it and fill it in later when they need it. Pediatricians, we teach this in, in, in pediatrics. Um, if you look at the Bright Futures Manual, which is the, the manual of how to do checkups, basically, um, and it's actually freely available online. You can download it, uh, the PDFs, because it's funded by the Maternal Child Health Bureau, so your tax dollars at work. Um, it's a co-project of the MCHB and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Much of what we're talking about is actually this stuff, is interactions, parenting support, nurturing development, et cetera. Because guess what? We don't see kids dying the way they used to from meningitis because of immunizations. Okay, I have some of my senior colleagues that used to be sticking needles in kids' backs on every night on call seven, eight times because it happened so often. I've actually forgotten how to do an LP. And I'm really glad I've forgotten to because that means we are doing it right, right? We do. So we're changing our focus from so much of this technical stuff. And we'll always need the technical stuff, of course. But we're changing that focus to saying, okay, but what's getting in kids' way now? What's getting in the way of their health and well-being? It's flunking out of school. It's behavior problems. It's all these other things that are keeping us from seeing the potential of these amazing intellects. So we actually, a lot of the Bright Futures talks about the support piece and so on. Uh, and I was actually on the committee that, that uh, the expert panel that helped develop the fourth edition. We spent a lot of time talking about exactly these sorts of things. This is what modern pediatrics should do. I'm fully aware that there's still docs out there who are just going down the checklists and whatever. And part of that is, frankly, how we've industrialized healthcare, you know, into this kind of, you know, conveyor belt sort of model, you know. Um, but the ideal is certainly laid out there and does exactly what you're what you're saying. Yes, sir. Um, in this state, teachers have been discredited mm -hmm. enormously in the last eight years. Do you mm -hmm. do anything in terms of partnering with teachers? Mm -hmm. I mean, reach out and read would be a natural for schools. Mm -hmm. And if they could do that in conjunction with healthcare clinics, mm -hmm. that would be great. Mm -hmm. So the question is about teachers and schools and, and partnering with reach out and read and so on. I talk to a lot of school districts. Um, uh, the CESAs, the, the consortia of uh, school districts that exist around the state, um, I think I've spoken to at least half of them. Uh, you I, you know. I, I see it as helping schools understand where some of the issues they're seeing come from. That the roots of all this are before them in many cases and they're stuck dealing with it, with all the behavior and the learning problems and so on, right? That, and 
The problem is, I think, for a lot of K through 12 education, they view early as age four. Right? Like, hey, we're doing 4K now. Look at how early we're going. I'm sitting going, you've got to go earlier, you know, <laughs> and so on. And some of them are starting to get it. And some are either partnering or they're even starting their own home visiting programs or so on, saying, we need to get back to birth because this affects the product we're starting with, right? A kindergarten entry or 4K entry or, or so on. I also speak to a lot of early childhood audiences um, and because this is more in their wheelhouse. But let's also remember, most children especially in poverty, under age two, are actually not in childcare settings. And they may not be in high quality childcare settings, they may not be in any, they may be at home with their parents, they might be in neighbor care or family or relative care of some sort, where we're not gonna reach them necessarily through educating the early childhood network. You're right though, this is exactly where we see this connection. Now the problem is, of course, that to do reach on read does take some money and some funding. So, and last I checked, school districts weren't exactly like swimming in dollars. Yeah, so right. that, that becomes some of the, the shared challenge, but I think they're starting to recognize they gotta look at programs like this and they need to think innovatively about how do they reach out and how do they connect with clinics? Maybe they can connect better with clinics through a partnership around Reach Out and Read. Because I also know that schools sometimes are very frustrated trying to communicate with healthcare. We're not easy to reach, right? And we have nine layers of people between you and, and, and physicians, right? because otherwise everything comes to us and we'll never see a patient because there's all these phone calls and all, right? So, teaming, right? what's that? There's a need for yeah. more teaming. Yeah, there's a need for more teaming and I think for rewarding on both sides the time spent working with each other and developing these connections um, and, and so on. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah.